Um, and so our next speaker is Ryan Baker. Uh, he is an associate professor at Teachers College at uh, Columbia University. And uh, his research is in, in uh, educational data mining, all oh, right, yes, I remember now, <laughs> um, to model engagement and learning. Please welcome uh, Dr. Ray. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. You know, given the last two talks, I, I kind of wish I had uh, planned ahead to discuss our research in SimCity Edu, which we've done a little, or in Automated Detectors of Science Inquiry. I, I feel like I brought the wrong talk, but hopefully this one will still be interesting. At least I will be discussing at least a little bit gaming a system and intelligent tutors. Um, I'll talk a, at least a, at least I'll talk about my lab's work to bring educational data mining a little closer to psychometrics, which hopefully will be a nice complement to the work that Bob mentioned to make psychometrics a bit more computational. Nice to see kind of people coming together from both sides. So I'll discuss our work uh, to automatically assess engagement in online learning using <coughs> what's sometimes called learning analytics, sometimes called educational data mining. Uh, context, virtual learning environments, including science simulations like Inkits at the top left, uh, games like Physics Playground uh, from Val Schutz Lab at the bottom left, uh, games like uh, EcoMove uh, from Didi's Lab at Harvard and Jody Clark Majora's Lab at Utah, um, and intelligent tutors like Slide Tutor at the bottom and assessments on the right. So we've been looking at engagement across a lot of types of online learning. We take the kind of really rich log data that uh, our keynote this morning talked about. Um, and the goal is to try to obtain human judgments on student engagement and affect, taking the idea that people can tell when somebody's bored. I can tell if any of you are bored, although hopefully none of you are. Um, leverage the, at least not yet, um, leverage these human judgments to develop u models using data mining that can replicate those human judgments solely from the interactions between the student and the software. So we're going, to take a mo we're going to take this data on what you, when humans think students are bored or frustrated or so on, and we're going to build a model using this relatively small scale data that we can then apply to much larger scale data. The goal is measures that, first of all, are automated. They can make assessments about students in real time, no human in the loop. Second, fine-grained, able to make assessments about students second by second, and demonstrate to apply to new students in new contexts. There's not necessarily the sort of interpretability that you get from a psychometric process because uh, you can't entirely inspect how these models are working internally, but they agree with human beings for entirely new data, even when taken to new populations or new uh, systems. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, we co collect high quality human data on, uh, called training labels on when students have a certain engagement state. We synchronize the log data to the field observations. We distill meaningful data features for the learning environment. I'll talk a little more about this in a sec. But we base it on qualitative study of the log files, the experience of our field observers in the classrooms, and past experience with other data sets, which we have a decent amount by now. We develop automated detectors using uh, data mining machine learning classification algorithms. And again, we validate the detectors for new data sets. Um, our field observations are obtained uh, through what we call the BROMP protocol which is a protocol designed to reduce disruption of the students. Uh, some features of the protocol involve observing the peripheral vision or side glances. I usually like to do a demo, but I don't really have a very good angle for it right now. Um, hover over the student who's not being observed, so your observer effects are hitting the wrong student. And 20 second round robin observations of several students where you're kind of quickly going through the classroom. And the principle that bored looking people are boring which is to say that if I am just standing in the classroom, moseying around, looking at my cell phone and looking unhappy, nobody really wants to look at me. People don't want to look at somebody who's, uh, who looks unhappy or bored. Um, we conduct this uh, through the Android app Heart. Um, it's for free on my webpage. You can install it on your Android. <clears throat> we get intra reliability, Cohen's Kappa, about 80% better than base rate for behavior, uh, uh, behavioral manifestations of engagement. I'll give a couple examples in a minute, but 65% better than base rate for affect. And uh, BROMP, uh, we now have over 150 coders. We've actually kind of lost count. It's somewhere over 200 at this point uh, in four countries. <coughs> 
So the feature engineering process, you know, you, you don't just throw a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, you have to actually build stuff out of the logs in a meaningful fashion. Um, unmodified log files aren't good enough. Uh, we started with just kind of developing simple semantic features. How long does the student take between actions? What kind of widget is it? Uh, what skill does it involve? Annotations of correctness and hint use? And this is a good start, but it's not really good enough. We then, um, and I'm talking about a decade ago now, not quite a hundred years ago or uh, Imperial China, but still, feels like it for me. Um, a decade ago, we started taking tr straightforward transformations like the time taken between actions and standard deviations below or above the average for other students doing the same thing. Idea being that if everybody takes six seconds to do something, nine seconds means something totally different than if everybody takes 40 seconds to do it. Uh, we looked at the student's history of help requests and incorrect actions, and this got us kind of decent baseline models, enough to get me a PhD anyways. Um, and then we built on this with um, existing features that we'd created for past projects, things like Bayesian knowledge tracing, which is a classic algorithm um, for telling what a student knows while that knowledge is actually changing while it's being measured. Um, we built on this with uh, starting to do structured feature brainstorming by domain experts, field observers, and EDM practitioners. This kind of looks a lot like some of the early stages of evidence-centered design thinking. Um, we found that when we really kind of bring in a lot of stakeholders and have them think about what kind of behaviors really should reflect what we're looking for, it leads to better models. And if we introduce into our data mining process bias in favor of the features that the domain experts think will have higher construct validity, it leads to better generalizability of new data sets. So sometimes even uh, this, in, this bias introduction process doesn't make it look like you're doing better on the current data, but when you go to new data, you do better. <coughs> and then we um, built forward um, from there to actually not just kind of work with domain experts and field observers to kind of get them to brainstorm, but say, let's actually do structured interviewing of domain experts and field observers. We interview them, we build models kind of rationally, um, and then after we've built those models that reflect their reasoning, we then distill the operators that they use in those models, and we conduct data mining using those operators. And uh, this gaming system, uh, intentional student misuse of online learning to get through that learning, we thought we'd plateaued on how good we could do at detecting it. Um, but Luc Paquette, um, a former postdoc in my lab now at University of Illinois, found that when we did this process of really building the models that reflected human reasoning, but then taking out of them the components that people used to reason with, building data mining around them, it led to better models even on uh, thoroughly studied constructs. <coughs> so kind of to quickly summarize, if you just make up a model, you just really quickly hack something together, that actually does pretty poorly. We have a couple uh, comparisons where people made up models just saying, okay, people are gaming the system if they answer in less than two seconds. That actually does worse than chance at agreeing to human beings. Um, if you do data mining without thorough feature engineering, you do okay. You do thorough engine feature engineering, you do well. But if you integrate data mining with kind of a full knowledge engineering process where you develop the model that field observers use to reason through when they're identifying the behavior, you get the really good performance on new data from the same system. And it turns out, and this, um, I'm gonna talk my way out of a job, you know, or at least a career pretty soon. Um, if you do that thorough knowledge engineering process and really represent the model that the field observers use to represent the problem to their self, uh, Luc Paquette found that actually you can transfer the model to entirely new learning platforms without any retraining, any modification. So um, it's not as good on, the, uh, on a given system as a hybrid data mining um, knowledge engineering approach. The hybrid works best if you're trying to do better on your current platform for totally new students, but the um, pure knowledge engineering approach works better to transfer to entirely new systems. <coughs> so data mining approach, we try a small number of algorithms that fit different kinds of patterns and that all tend to underfit. And underfitting means we're not trying to squeeze out the last little bit of variance, but we're getting a model that's maybe not as good as it could be. Um, models like deep learning, which was mentioned earlier, really try to squeeze out all the variance. Uh, we tend to use older algorithms. Um, these are all like 1980s, 1990s algorithms that leave some variance on the table, but in return um, aren't as likely to fit to noise in the relatively small data sets we're using to build our models. 
And by relatively small, I mean only thousands of observations. Um, we then, as I mentioned, validate that the models work on entirely new students, that they work on entirely new content, and that the models transfer between populations. Uh, one thing that data mining in education has sometimes been criticized for is just treating the data set you come in with like it's the only data set you'll ever see. And in particular, if you're doing an approach where you're building models on a training set, it can be really tempting to just get the most convenient set you can. You know, the group of uh, suburban kids uh, near your university where the teachers and the school districts are very happy to let you in. Avoid having to deal with uh, districts like New York City where you have to do a six month process just to be able to walk into a classroom. But a lot of models don't generalize between urban and rural populations. And you can often end up with situations where you end up with a model that only works for the populations you studied. We're very careful to try to build our models on a broader data set and test whether they will work on urban, rural, suburban students. So the result, models that can make inferences in real time, or at least with a 20 second delay, and models that can be applied at scale to retrospective log files. You know, the first one enables us to do intervention. The second one enables us to use these models for analysis. We've built these kind of engagement detectors uh, for 10 different online learning platforms now. Um, one example of how well they do, um, for the assessment system, which is a, a um, online homework and classroom platform for middle school mathematics primarily, developed by Neil and Christina Heffernan at Worcester Polytechnic. Uh, the A prime statistic, which tells you, for example, you have all the students who are bored in one urn and all the students who aren't bored in another urn, you take one uh, student out of each urn and you compare to see which is which, how likely will your model get it right? Uh, for things like boredom, we're able to tell 63% of the time, which is 23% better than base rate. For other things like gaming the system and off-test behavior, we're in the low 80%. Now, are those numbers good enough? Um, people typically consider for first-line medical diagnostics that you want an A prime of around 0.8. Um, and people do, uh, f folks do typically use um, medical tests with, uh, with reliability, not reliability, with goodness in this level for to make real world decisions. 63%, not good enough that you'd typically see it being used in medicine unless there was no other alternative. Still better than you'd probably do if you went to Vegas. Uh, so, yeah. Um, the bottom line is that if you're trying to make a uh, pedagogical decision where the cost of being wrong isn't that bad, uh, you can use a detector at that top level. In fact, um, Cut ahead. Those detectors for boredom, even though they're um, still you know, not up to the level of medical diagnostics, still predict uh, standardized exam scores and college attendance. These metrics in general can predict from middle school how well the student will do on a standardized exam at the end of the year, whether they'll go to college, and what they'll major in when they go to college. So it does have actionable information, not just um, detecting the construct in the short term, but detecting longer term things that matter. And by the way, I should say it's not always boredom that's worst. Boredom was worse in the assessment system, but in the V-Medic environment, boredom detection was actually the best with a prime of 0.85. It varies by environment. <coughs> so I see I only have a couple of minutes, so I'll just really quickly run through a few things that we use these for. We can use them to advance the science of learning. Uh, we've studied the, we studied the short-term impacts of affect on learning, finding evidence that extended confusion and frustration are associated with worse outcomes, but brief confusion or frustration are associated with positive outcomes. The idea being that if you never really struggle with the material, you don't have the same opportunity to learn it. Boredom, by the way, is a bad thing, whether it's brief or extended. And that, yeah, that's seen in other uh, researchers' work as well. Um, we also um, use these uh, kind of models. Uh, here are some of our pilot reports to provide this kind of data to guidance counselors, telling guidance counselors why individual students are at risk of not going to college. And we also have been working with Reasoning Mind to deploy reports on student engagement to regional coordinators to, in order to, not to punish teachers, but to find teachers whose students are becoming really disengaged and provide those teachers with uh, additional professional development on how to use the software more effectively in their classes. And there's actually evidence that we can detect uh, from the way that the students are engaged in the system, whether the teachers have been to professional development and whether they're using practices that were designed for more effective work with the curriculum. We also use these in automated interventions. Um, screw the tutor gets upset if you game the system. 
Uh, it helped students game the system less, helped students who were behind catch up, and the uh, middle school boys loved to make the puppy mad. <laughs> so it didn't entirely work according to plan. <laughs> We've also used the systems for curricular refinement, finding out what material disengages students to then redesign it. So the big idea is that with the kind of data we can get on student learning and this combination of data mining and knowledge engineering, we can make inferences about students in real time that are predictive of long-term outcomes. With the goal of tracking a student's engagement now, predicting the longer-term impact, and intervening to help re-engage students and support their learning. Helping to create an educational system more sensitive to individual learners' needs. So thank you very much, and I'm glad to answer any questions. <laughs>